Okay, recording is on. Good morning and welcome everyone to the class today. We're going to take a moment to pray together and then we will get started. Elisha, would you please uh, pray with all of us and we'll start. I'm Professor. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning and praise your holy name mm. for the gift of life and the many good things that you have brought our way. Father, we pray, commit our session into your hands, O oh God. Mm. We pray that you cause your Holy Spirit to come and lead us, guide us, and teach us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray for an understanding and grant all chances to Pastor Ashes as he leads and guides us and teaches us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you and welcome, everyone. So today, uh, I think it might be our final lecture uh, in this course on faith. I want to just address, uh, the plan is to address some practical side to the exercise of faith, like how do we balance faith and reason and the facts? You know, how do we how do how do we work with those things? <laughs> we have to live by faith in God and His Word. Then there's our own reason, you know, our mind. Uh, we think, and you know, God's given us our mind to use. Uh, how, how does that? come to play. And then there are facts. Facts means, look, this is what's actually happening. Um, so how do we, how do we, you know, uh, live by faith in God and his word, along with the mind that we have, which tends to think and reason and, you know, uh, has its own uh, reasoning and so on. And then there are facts this is what's happening uh, and and uh, so how do we put all that together and of course we want to avoid uh, a dangerous area uh, of presumption and so um, i just want to kind of address this practical uh, challenge when it comes to living by faith in god uh, in this last uh, lecture and then we will uh, do a quick review, just go through the entire, you know, all the topics that we covered, so we'll just get a full overview of what we have covered in this course. So that's the plan for today, and let's see, you know, if, whether we finish in one hour or two hours, we'll just uh, go, go with the flow. All right, so uh, some of this, what I'm sharing to, with you today, you may see it in an uh, in another course that we have uh, which is uh, 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 which is um, uh, emotional wholeness and deliverance uh, which is uh, sorry inner wholeness which i think yeah which is a second year course we talk about the mind uh, the soul of man you know the mind the will the emotions and you know that that that, that emotional aspect of person so in that course you'll get into a lot of deeper things on how to bring wholeness to the soul. Uh, and part of that, you will also be touching on some of the things uh, we will be talking today. So there will be this overlap uh, between what we're saying today and what you're going to be looking at in that course on inner wholeness that deals a little bit more in depth with the mind and the emotions of man. So what we want to do here in this lecture is, uh, you know, how do we balance faith, reason, uh, a renewed mind and leading of the Holy Spirit and avoid the pitfall of presumption? So this is a, 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 an area where, uh, uh, you know, we need to get clarity on, we need to be very clear. And uh, it's also an area where many people get into trouble because they don't distinguish between uh, how, uh, how to live by faith, or they don't, you know, we, people don't believe, and I say people, I'm talking about believers, that we don't learn how to balance or how to have the interaction between faith and the mind 
and uh, how to know when the Holy Spirit is leading us and when uh, it's just presumption, something we make up, you know. So I, I, I put this little box diagram here. It's nothing, you know, it's not, not like a biblical chart or anything. It's just something that I put to try to explain this. Uh, so if you think about our mind, that means uh, the, our mind is given to us by God, right? Our ability to reason, think, analyze. It, it's a good thing. The mind is not a bad thing. The mind was created by God. It's a, it's a masterpiece, one a masterpiece of God's creation, really. When you think about the, 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 the brain and the mind, the brain is the physical organ, uh, and uh, people can study the brain. But then the mind is much bigger than the brain. It, it, it is this intangible aspect of, of the person. Some of it is connected to the functions of the brain, but there's a lot that you cannot connect directly uh, to the functions of the brain. It's, it's there. You know it's there. Uh, and it's intangible, you know, uh, the mind. Uh, the feelings, the emotions, and all of that. Anyway. So when you talk about the, the believer's mind, uh, we have, first of all, our ability to reason. Right? And that means God has given us the ability to think, uh, uh, you know, to analyze and to reason, which is a good thing, like I was saying. And we need to use it every day. Maybe use it every day. For instance, right now, uh, we have used our mind to connect to this classroom. So you know, you know how you, you log into a Google account, you go to classroom and then you click on the particular uh, class you, you're connected so I mean that's it's a good thing you know we can use our mind to do a lot of good things our reason uh, you know right from you know the food we eat and how we take care of ourselves the work we do so many things in this natural world we are using our mind and God gave us our mind to use it's, it's fine but then what the Bible is telling us is that we must renew our mind. So the believer is living with a renewed mind. That means it's a mind that is learning uh, not to be conformed to the ways of this world, but it's a mind that is learning to think according to the ways and thoughts of God. Right. So that's the believer's mind. It's a renewed mind. It's a mind that lives by the word of God. So we begin to think aligned to the, the word of God. So that's the renewed mind of the believer. And as part of the renewed mind, we see there is our human reason, the reason that God is, the ability to reason, which we have. But then there is the leading of the Holy Spirit, which can override reason. See, there are times when the Holy Spirit will lead us. Now, uh, everything I'm saying, I've kind of, you know, uh, explained it in, in the text here, so you can actually read it later. But I'm just uh, uh, explaining this to us, right? So there are times the Holy Spirit will lead us uh, that 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 is beyond our ability to understand, our reason. You know, for example, if the Holy Spirit tells us, you can tell somebody, uh, call so and so right now and pray with that person. Now, you say, well, I haven't spoken to this person, you know, maybe in four months. I have no idea what's going on in their life, but the Holy Spirit has put that person in your heart. You feel like I have to call that person and I have to talk to that person and pray with that person. Now, it is outside the realm of reason because you don't find any reason why I should call that person. And I haven't spoken to that person maybe for four or five months. I have no idea what's going on in their life. But right now, I feel like I need to call that person. What's happening? The Holy Spirit is leading you and me. He's leading us beyond our reason. So what do we do? At that moment, we, while we value our ability to reason, which God has given to us, we yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit by faith. Right? By faith. It's just a matter of faith. You can't explain it. You know, why do you have to, you know, call that person and pray, you know, talk to the person, pray with the person. I mean, you, there's no, there's no, you know, logical thing to it other than the Holy Spirit's prompting you. He's put that person in your mind, put that person in your heart and says, do that. 
So the leading of the Holy Spirit can be outside the scope or the realm of our reason, our ability to understand, logic, analyze. And for the believer, ultimately, there is faith in God's word. That means we live by the promises and the principles of God's word. Now, why do you and I live by the word of God? It's faith. It's faith. Right? Why? Because we believe God. And we believe God's word. His word is truth. So, even in our mind, faith is at work. And faith is telling us, I have to believe God's word. I have to believe his promises, I have to live by his principles. And we do it by faith. We, The Bible says we walk by faith. That means I believe his promises, I live by his principles, by faith in his word. And there will be times that faith in God's word is about, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's way beyond reason. Now, all of this is happening in the mind of the believer. So this, this white box, I, I put, it's representing the mind of the believer. So in our mind, right, faith in God's word will override reason. Example, uh, you know, I'm just making, suppose you've kept aside a certain amount of money and you want to use it for your own personal need, or something you, you're planning to buy or whatever, you kept some money aside. And then the Holy Spirit says, you know, you see that person there, I want you to give some of your money, that money to that person. Holy Spirit's prompting you. And then you go to the Word of God, and the Word of God says, you know, give, it'll be given to you. The Word of God says, you know, you when you give to someone who is in need, you're actually giving to God, and God will repay you. Now, in your in your mind, the the reason you kept that money aside is because you wanted to buy a certain thing. So that's the mind, our mind. We have been working with our mind. We've been, you know, doing something which is fine, but now. The Holy Spirit is telling us something, and God's Word is telling us something which is beyond our mind. The Word of God is saying, you, you know, you help someone in need. The Word of God teaches us to give. And so, what do we do? Our reason is saying, well, I've been keeping this money aside because I want to buy something. But now God's word is promising me, inst both instructing me as a principle and is promising me that when I give, God will take care of my need. And so in the mind of the believer, ultimately we live by faith in God's word. Yes, we use our reason. We're not saying we don't use our reason. We do use our reason. But the leading of the Holy Spirit and faith in God's word overrides our reason. So this is how the mind of the believer is at work. I mean, this is a very simplistic box diagram, but you know, I hope you understand. You know, the interactions that are going on in our minds uh, when we, between reason, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and faith in God, His word. So while this is happening, we must also be careful not to get into the area of presumption. Now, this is a gray area. So purposely, I put it in a gray box. Gray area means it really is a, a difficult thing. Now, what is presumption? Presumption is that we think that the Lord, the Holy Spirit is leading us when he actually has not led us. That's one way we get into presumption. Or second way we get into presumption is when we 
misapply faith in God's word in a way he didn't doesn't want us to apply, then we get into presumption. So there are two ways, main ways, we get into presumption. One, when we think that the Holy Spirit is telling us something when actually he is not. Or we misapply, wrongly apply faith in God's word. Then we get into an area of presumption. Presumption means I'm presuming something, I'm making an assumption which is actually incorrect. Now, when we are in the area of presumption, we are on shaky ground. When we are obeying the leading of the Holy Spirit or living by faith in God's word, God backs us up 100%. We cannot fail. We cannot fail. But when we step into this area of presumption, God is not obligated because we are outside his word, outside his actual direction. And we've got into something where we are making some assumptions and we will get into trouble. The problem is that the mind is dealing with facts. So what does reason do? deal with? It deals with facts. Okay, this is what has been said. And for us, we must learn to, you know, balance these three properly. That means the reason, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, faith in God and His Word. We have to balance it. So, example. Example. I'll just give you an example. Suppose a believer is unwell, is sick, got some disease. And the believer goes to the hospital. The doctor says, look, this is your problem. And uh, we've got to, you know, from a medical point, this is what we would do to help you. You know, it may be some kind of a treatment, it may be some kind of medication, it may be whatever. So, so, so the doctor said, this is it. So th th that is fact. That is information here that comes to the mind. Now, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What should I do in this situation? There's no clear word from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not saying, don't go to the doctor or don't take the medicine or don't take the treatment. He's not saying don't do it. Go to God's word. God's word says, the Lord is your healer. He heals us of all our diseases. He, uh, you know, the healing, by his stripes, we have been healed. So, the believer has certain facts. There's a disease. The, the doctors are saying, this is the treatment we can give you. But, you know, some people will survive. Some people may not. We don't know. But this is what we will do to help you. The Holy Spirit is, there's no word from the Holy Spirit saying, don't take that treatment. There's just calmness, peace, peace, quietness. And the word of God has the promises for healing. So now the believer is in a dilemma. I have faith in God and his word. And I'm going to, I, I've learned, you know, we know the, the, the principles of faith and we know how to use faith. But I'm faced with fact. There's a disease. Doctors are recommending a certain treatment. Should I take it? Should I not take it? The Holy Spirit is not telling me, don't take it. So what should the believer do? Now, if the believer in this moment says, God told me not to take the treatment, so I'm refusing the treatment, I'm just going to trust in God. Now, 
if they say God told me not to take the treatment, that's presumption. Why? The Holy Spirit never said, don't take the treatment. They are presuming something of the Holy Spirit. And based on that, they say, I don't want the treatment. They come into this area of presumption. And they, you know, we don't know where they are as far as the Word of God is concerned. I mean, yes, you know the Word, but then, you know, for you, for to build up faith in the Word requires some time. And you may need to spend time in the Word to build up faith. And, um, but they've come into this area of presumption, so they've rejected the treatment, they're not taking the treatment. And what happens in some cases, I'm not saying it happens in all cases, but in some cases, what happens? They've come into this area of presumption. The disease progresses, the believer dies. Then we are questioning, hey, they said, God said not to take treatment. They said they're having faith in God. But they died. What happened? Well, the Holy Spirit never told them, don't take the treatment. But they presumed he said it. And they presumed that They'll just go by faith in God's word. And they, they may not have really built up faith in God's word, which takes time. And sin, then they're in this area of presumption. So what would we recommend in a situation like that? Well, we'll say, look, build up. You, you, you know, okay, The Holy Spirit never told you don't go for it. So use your mind. Do what you can in the natural. And at the same time, build your faith in God's word. Take time to read, meditate, confess the word, feed your spirit with the word. See, it's like, you know, you have to build your faith muscle. Now you're dealing with a, with, with a mountain, right? So you've got to bring your faith up to the level of a mustard seed. You've got to let it grow. And so you've got to feed your faith. So do both. There's nothing wrong here in using our reason or our mind because God gave us our mind. He, with our mind, he gave us the ability to understand natural things, do what we can in the natural. There's nothing wrong with that. And at the same time, you build up your faith in God's word and believe God for healing. Right? Or that's just one scenario. I'll give, I'll give us one more scenario and then we will open it up for some discussions. Think about another scenario where A believer reads the word of God, which says, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in want. Uh, the believer reads the word of God, which says, my God shall supply all your need. And so he reads the word. And says, hey, the Bible says God will supply all my needs. So I'm going to give up my job. And uh, I don't need to work. I'm just going to quit my job. And uh, I'm just going to use faith in God's God and his word. And, uh, you know, the money will come in. Now, the Holy Spirit never told the believer, quit your job. God has given us reason, and the believer knows, I need to work to earn money. So, according to our, you know, um, the mind is, you need to work to earn money. The Holy Spirit didn't tell this believer, quit your job. So it's, there's no word from the Holy Spirit. And the believer presumes that I can just believe some of the promises, but not practice the principles. The principle of the word of God is you got to work. Sorry, you have to work. So the believer presumes to have faith in the promises, ignoring the principles of God's word. There is no word from the Holy Spirit instructing the believer to quit their job. Reason clearly says, look, you have you have to pay so much money for rent, for utilities, for food, for all these things are there and we're responsible for it. So what's happening? They're getting into the area of presumption. Why? Because they're presuming faith in the promises without following the principles, without a direct leading from the Holy Spirit, 
and ignoring reason. So they're getting into the area of presumption. So what happens? The believer then begins to struggle, suffer, a lot of consequences for not having the money uh, and so on. So that is another scenario where they're presuming faith when God has not directed that person. Now, there may be times when the Holy Spirit tells a believer, saying, look, I want you to do this and this. I'll maybe you know, give up your job and take the next two months to prepare for you know, doing something different, whatever. So there's a clear word from the Holy Spirit. The believer then sets aside the required money. Says, okay, yeah, I have the enough, I have enough money to cover next two months. Or maybe they don't have it, but there's a clear word from God saying, I want you to take you know, quit your job for the next two months, prepare for what I'm going to show you. And the believer takes a step of faith because he's got a word from the Holy Spirit, and plus he's got God's written word saying, you know, he will provide. So there's a combination here. Now, whether he, the believer may have saved money for next two months or may not have saved money, there could be various scenarios. But in this third scenario, what we're saying is there's a clear instruction of the Holy Spirit. And then based on that, he's able to have faith in the promises and he's still on safe ground because the Holy Spirit has instructed the believer to do that. So... What I want to help us understand is that we must have faith in God's word. But in the practical situations of life, we must, we must use our reason, and there's nothing wrong in using reason, using your mind, processing things. And we must also depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit and balance these three And avoid getting into presumption, because that is dangerous ground. So I want to pause here and just, you know, take up some, let's just discuss uh, this and, uh, you know, ask some questions around it, because uh, I want us to be clear that faith in God is so powerful. He's called us to live by faith, and yet, there is also the aspect of the leading of the Holy Spirit, and there is the aspect of reason. Uh, reason, God has given us a mind to process the facts that we see in this world. And the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself guiding us specifically in certain situations of each of our lives that's relevant to us, we must pay attention to that. So let's look at the questions. Uh, number one, by any chance, would the Holy Spirit say no for treatment? The answer to number one is yes. The Holy Spirit can, you know, if the Holy Spirit gives you a clear word in your heart, that don't, don't take it. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, that's when you just say, okay, I know in my heart the Holy God has spoken. He says he doesn't want me to um, do this. Uh, and therefore, I will not go forward. But we've got to be sure that the Holy Spirit has spoken to us. right? Number two, second question. What if the family doesn't have enough money to do the treatment? Can they refuse treatment? Um if the family doesn't have enough money and uh, the treatment is available, I think the family should make an effort uh, to try and arrange for the money. Uh, you know, and uh, to see if they can find ways and means to get the treatment. If they cannot, then yeah, then there's, there's no option if, you know, if they just are not able to afford it, then sure. The only option is believe God. And that financial constraint becomes a practical limitation. And then you have no choice but to say, God, look, there is treatment, but it's not affordable. And we cannot go for it. Uh, so we are limited. But you are our help. And we are putting all our faith in you. 
and uh, you know trust in you right and um, three in case one of our believers has acted upon presumption with leaders do we stand with them in faith or correct them if you need to correct them how do we do it that's a good question number three see this is where as, as leaders you know we need to be able to lovingly correct people and i have done that you know uh, when when uh, 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 when people have been in situations like this i've told them now whether they are willing to accept correction or not that is something that is entirely their choice but as a leader, it's my responsibility to tell them that, look, what you are having faith in God for is really not right. You know, for example, you know, if uh, a family member passed away, and sure, maybe they died prematurely, they died before their time, and they said, uh, they say, okay, I'm believing God to bring that person back from the dead. Now, there is a time when we pray for resurrection. That's, you know, I would say generally say within the first 24 hours, you pray. And if God brings a person back, great. But after that, you have to be careful because there are also legal implications for keeping a dead body in your home or somewhere to keep praying, you know. So, okay, let's say, you know, the funerals happen, but this believer says, no, I'm believing God to bring that person back from the dead. And they go on doing this after three months, two years, three years. The believer says, I believe God is going to bring that person from the dead. You know, I've told the person, say, look, this is not right. We do believe that the Bible does, Jesus did instruct us, you know, in Matthew 10, 7 and 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Not like what you're saying. You know, three years later, five years later, they still say, I believe God is going to bring that person back from the dead. Now, that's really in the area of presumption. And, you know, so I've had some of these conversations, told them, look, what you're doing is wrong. This is not it. Uh, and so our, our goal, our, our, let's say, not our goal, but our responsibility as leaders is to lovingly correct people when they are in the area of presumption and if they choose to take our instruction, that's good. If they choose to disregard it, then, you know, we've done our part. And God is not going to hold you responsible for their choice thereafter. Right? So uh, that's that's uh, the response to that. Third, good questions. Let's see now. Yeah. So uh, verse 19 to 21, yeah. So our heart is to be right before God. If the believer is, okay, next one. The believer is struggling to go against some of their assumptions and based on the above words, what is the right course of action to help someone like that? If the believer, so this is First John 3, 19 to 21, and the question is, if the believer is struggling, to go against some of their assumptions, okay? And basically above us, what is the right course of action to help someone like that? Hmm. So I'm trying to understand the question. So what we're saying is, um, okay, the believers made some assumptions. Yeah, um, yeah, Pastor. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, suppose the believer is uh, thinking that taking medication is uh, wrong in God's sight. You know, it is a very hard, um, you know, uh, strong belief for that person, and mm. they are uh, they are thinking that God will God will condemn them if they take medication mm. so strongly. They're believing it so strongly. Mm. Uh, so, what can be done uh, in that case? Right. So, you know, um, if, you know, so, so there are people like this where they totally refuse any medication. Now, there are two things. One is, 
if a person is doing it because they genuinely have faith in, in, in God, God will heal. Uh, that's good. But at the same time, we can explain to them. And again, we don't want to you know, violate their faith. We don't want to violate their faith. But what we want to do is to give them the freedom to receive medical attention, give them that place of freedom. So how do we do it? So what we can explain to them is see, even in the Bible, you find situations where God used some natural things to help people. Right? So example is in the case of uh, Isaiah and King Hezekiah, you know, there as I prophesied that God would, you know, said, okay, God's going to extend your life. But at the same time, he said, you know, you take this, uh, 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 I forget the name of the, 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 the fruit or whatever it was used, and you apply it to your body. Okay. And uh, so there was a word from God, but there was also an instruction on something the person could use to help the condition. Or when you, you know, the typical example is in First Timothy chapter 5, where Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, because of your frequent stomach illnesses, I'm just paraphrasing it in simple English, because of frequent stomach illnesses, uh, take a little wine. So in those days, wine was used for its medical or medicinal values. They didn't have the kinds of treatments or uh, medicines we have today, but for stomach issues. And Timothy apparently had some frequent stomach problems. We don't know what it is, but Paul tells to Timothy, you know, take a little wine for your stomach issues. So here is a great apostle Paul, whom God used powerfully in healing and deliverance. And yet he is advising Timothy to use a little wine to help his stomach problems. So he didn't say don't use it or you know just believe, but take something practical. So we can give these examples and let the person know that it's not wrong in the eyes of God uh, to use the resources God has given to us to help our bodies. While at the same time, we continue with faith in God and his words. There's nothing wrong. But the final decision will be theirs, you know, that, and we respect that, you know, if they feel very strongly, they shouldn't take me. Say, okay. Now, the outcomes, we've seen both, in the sense there have been some outcomes where people die because they refused the help that was available. Uh, and then there are some outcomes where, yeah, you know, through their faith in God, they come out well. And thank God for that. But from our side, what can we do? We can show them biblically that it is not wrong to use whatever natural help that is available while we also continue with faith in God. And we find this in you know, both Old and New Testament, these two examples. Uh, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. So, uh, was um, was was uh, the explanation clear enough? Any questions? Any further? Go ahead, please. Okay. One question, little uh, off track though, but okay. uh, imagine a person has believed um, and and they have not seen uh, the miracle. Let's say that person passed away, and how would you suggest that? Uh, how I, I mean, we cannot console them by any words, but what would be what should be our approach while visiting them? Like they believed in faith, and uh, let's say it was a sickness, and the person passed away. Yeah. So one is we never judge or condemn. Uh, so one is we don't try to try to explain. Right? Because the fact is, we don't necessarily know the exact thing that prevented healing in that particular situation. 
We don't. Unless God reveals, right? Unless God reveals specifically. Because every case is so different. It's so unique. Right? So, okay. And this happens. I believe a person has been believing God for healing. The, the person dies. The family is believing God. The church around them is believing God. And the person dies. How should we respond? How should we comfort? How should we console? First is never judge. Never try to explain. Why? Because we don't know. Now, we can know, we know the principles of faith. We know this is how we are to walk in faith, but we are not to judge another person's faith. So we don't try to explain that. And just say, you know, only God knows really what was the real reason. Right? So we don't try to judge, we don't try to instead, we just point to two things. One is we point to the hope that we have of eternal of you know of the of the fact that when a believer dies, they're in the presence of God and there will be resurrection. Second, we point to the fact that God's word has not changed. His word is still truth. And our responsibility is to keep believing God's word. Keep going. Right? But usually the second one, you do it later, not at that moment when you're going to console the person. You're going to console the person. You're going to be the family. The one thing is, look, yes, at this point of death, what is the hope we have as believers? We know that when we are absent in the body, we are present with the Lord. We're in a better place. And we know that ultimately death will be swallowed up in victory. So death is not, doesn't have the final say. So that's what we do. That's what we speak. And that's what we, you know, how we, we, we focus on. Later on, we encourage the person or the people saying, look, We've gone through this situation, but God's word has not changed. God's word is still truth. And so we're going to continue believing the word of God and living by faith in God and his word. So that's how we do it. But we don't try to, you know, judge or try to find an answer. Because unless God clearly reveals, then, you know, and, 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 and there's so many examples where people get into... Uh, people try to find answers and they actually end up hurting people. You know, and it, it sometimes it gets really crazy uh, when people come up with some really weird <laughs> reasons. You know, I remember once when, uh, uh, and this was so, this was really, really, uh, what, I don't know what, what word to use, but it was really harsh. Uh, in one case, a couple lost their child. Then somebody made this, you know, sent, this message on WhatsApp to that person saying, uh, because there was unfaithfulness between you, both of you, uh, God, you know, you lost your child. Now that was so harsh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, so that person is using the name of God saying, God revealed to me that there was, you know, unfaithfulness uh, between that husband and wife, and that's why the child died. And it was so harsh because, you know, I, I, I know that couple and I know, you know, they're godly couple. They're, they're living right before God. And, uh, and, uh, and, and for that person to send a message like that, it was so painful. So I had to call that other person and say, hey, this is something you never do. You know, not in the name of the Lord. You don't do these things. You know, they're going through pain. And uh, for you to say something like this, which is there's no basis you know, there's no basis to say something like this. And I said, look, I stand by that family because I know that family. I They are close friends. I know them. And then what you said is not true. You know, it's not true. So I had to step in. I had to bring really strong correction there. So we should avoid such things. They, they actually cause a lot of pain to people. So, you know, don't try to find an answer because God knows. Leave it to God. Right, uh, we don't know all the everything. What we can do is point to the reality of what the Bible teaches us: that death is not the end; a resurrection is coming. Uh, the believer is in the presence of God, which is far more beautiful, and uh, we just point to that. Okay. Any other questions?
practical side, it's a challenging bit, but uh, I just wanted to make sure we cover this so that uh, you know we don't end up making mistakes in walking by faith. Okay. So let me just do a quick review, and with that we will close. I know we have a, just a few more minutes, but <clears throat> we will quickly review the course, what we did here in this course on faith. Uh, what we have covered. So, you know, uh, and, I, and I love teaching this subject on faith, and I feel, and I know it's so important for all of us to learn to walk by faith. And faith is powerful because that's how we do great exploits for the kingdom of God. Uh, but we must learn to walk properly, correctly by faith. So, just to review this course, these last 22 lectures that we've had, I think, something like that. You know, we began with an introduction to faith. Then we talked about you know, God's sovereignty, grace, and faith, how they all interplay. God is sovereign. He gives us things by grace, but yet he requires us to walk by faith. So faith is not an option, even though God is sovereign. Then we looked at the ministry of Jesus, how in his ministry, Jesus really, you know, required people to come by faith. There were occasions when he did things based on the sovereignty of God as the Lord led him. But the normal was people had to come to him in faith uh, for them to receive. And he taught faith. So then we looked at Jesus' teaching on faith. So this is so important because for us, this is a big place where we learn about faith. Jesus taught us a lot about how to walk by faith in God. Then we did a quick look at faith in the Old Testament, uh, actually by looking at Hebrews chapter 11. We see that so many people in the Old Testament, they did great things in their lifetimes by faith in God. Then we looked closely at Abraham, who's the father of faith. We saw how did he walk by faith to receive the promises of God. And the Bible, New Testament is telling us he's an example, follow him. You know, how he received the promise. God gave him a promise. You will be the father of a big nation. It took him, it took quite a long time for that promise to happen. But Abraham journeyed by faith into that promise. And the Bible is telling us, follow that example. We talked about faith, hope, and love, how these three are all interconnected. We need to be people of hope. We need to be people of love if we are going to walk by faith. Then we talked about how faith uh, is pervasive in the believer's life. That means it affects every aspect of our life of our relationship with God, of how we face life, of how we minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, how we minister in the gifts of the Spirit. Every aspect of our life is undergirded by faith. We talked about nurturing our faith, that essentially we nurture our faith with the Word of God. We nurture our faith by uh, being around people of faith. We nurture our faith by listening to testimonies of faith. That just builds our faith up. We talked about the basis for strong faith. That means, you know, to have strong faith, we also need to be grounded in certain other truths. We need to be grounded in uh, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We need to be grounded in the integrity of God's word. Uh, we need to be grounded in our identity in Christ. We need to be grounded in the authority of the name of Jesus. These things, you know, are, are become the basis. So in, these are additional truths which undergird our life of faith. When we are strong in those truths, we can also be strong in our faith. Then we talked about practical ways to exercise faith. So we said, first, we must speak our faith. Jesus taught us that. Second, we need to act in line with our faith as much as possible as uh, situations, you know, uh, permit us act in line with our faith. We can also praise and thank God in faith. And we must be have endurance. That means your 
you go through time you hold on in faith through time and we must be determined that means you you have this resolve that you are going to get what god promised you that, that determination must be there and of course everything must be love, done in love so love is important we don't do it out of hate we don't do it out of competition we don't do it out of pride or you know jealousy no everything we do we do in love then we did this i like i mentioned this was kind of the more most uh, important lesson is kind of summarizing everything we've talked about in eight steps so it's okay let's put everything together in eight simple steps how to exercise faith right so uh, if you want to quickly uh, remind yourself or how do i do this go to this chapter how to exercise faith it kind of gives you those eight steps this is it if you do this over and over again in different situations this is how we bring all this uh, truth together in exercising faith then towards the end of this course we talked about collective faith when more than you know, two or more of us can come together in agreement and that is also very powerful so that uh, we exercise collective faith for various things to see the miracles of god see the deliverance of god uh, to serve people to pray for people so we come together in faith we also talked about the joy and the resil resilience and rest of faith that means when we are walking in faith we can walk in joy we can be resilient life is not going to put us down even if hardships come and we can walk in a place of rest that is peace and so on now uh, i you know i skip these these uh, these things here uh, essentially they are just telling us that these are things we can do in faith that is uh, faith is a true spiritual force uh, we can design dominate and demonstrate the power of god and there's a difference between the gift of faith and our own faith so this whole course was dealing with our faith in god in the class on the holy spirit you will learn about the gift of faith which is something the Holy Spirit imparts to us um, in that moment to do something specific. Right? We talked about the enemies of strong faith, you know, things like doubt, worry, anxiety, uh, low self-confidence. So keep those things away. Don't let them dominate uh, you. And uh, we talked about the perimeters of faith. That means we cannot override God's sovereign will we cannot override another person's free will so faith has its boundaries and then today we cover the last one which is uh, you know how do you balance faith and reason and avoid the pitfall of presumption so we've gone through all of these things so what's left is for me to give you these three assessments which I will put up uh, in class, uh, put up in this coursework, uh, and you have till end of November to finish it. I know I'm behind in giving you assessments, but I'll set up these three assessments for you, and you'll have till end of November to finish. This will be short. You know, each assessment won't take you more than one hour, or less than one hour to do. So you just need about three hours to finish them, and I'll put it out for you, and it will be done. Okay. Any final questions before we wrap things up? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, we will close today. Uh, just look out for these three assessments that I'll put up in the Google Classroom. And for those of you who are doing it on e-learning, uh, I'll put up these same assessments on e-learning so you do it uh, wherever you are, uh, you know, you're learning the course. Uh, they're going to be short assessments. Each should be just about one hour or less to do. Uh, the due date will be the end of November, November 26th. So you have plenty of time to do it. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, that's it. You know, we uh, are done with this course on faith. Uh, I want to encourage you to please, you know, just review the notes, review what we have learned. And... Um, you know, practice, live by faith, apply it into your life and situations.
Okay, last question there. Uh, Brother Manohar, you have a question. Please go ahead. No, just I wanted to ask, uh, will it be okay to wish a person of other faith uh, on their uh, festivals? For example, uh, can you say uh, happy Diwali to a, a, a non-Hindu? Hmm. And by saying, saying that, wishing him on their on their festivals, do we subscribe to what they believe, or is is does it amount supporting what they believe or worship? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, um, so would I tell a person, you know, enjoy your day, enjoy your festival, enjoy your Diwali? Uh, you know, I, I I don't see one is I don't find anything wrong in telling them, hey, enjoy whatever your your festival or whatever, because I know I I I don't really subscribe to I don't subscribe to that uh, festival, uh, the the spiritual significance of that festival, uh, but if they are uh, celebrating and. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think. What would I do? Uh, I just say, have a nice day. Have a, you know, have a good day. Um, uh, or I, I guess it's also depending on what the festival is, right? Uh, if it's a Diwali where it is celebrating something very spiritual, then I would be careful because I don't want that person to think I'm subscribing to that festival. But if it is more of a like a harvest festival, which we have, you know, they, they have like Onam or uh, at these harvest festivals, then it's like, hey, that's 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 just a natural thing. They're not necessarily worshiping God, but it's uh, uh, something about uh, celebrating harvest, celebrating uh, something. So uh, my answer to it is. Uh, I would be careful on what that festival is about. If it's about Diwali, I usually will not, because it is a spiritual festival. If it is about, you know, uh, something very generic, you know, like a harvest festival, or uh, they're having a birthday, or they're having uh, something very general, um, celebrating something, then that's okay. But if it's very spiritual, then I would avoid it, because even though I, I definitely don't subscribe to the spiritual significance of that festival, I don't want to leave a wrong impression that by greeting them for that festival, I'm actually subscribing to it, right? So I want to avoid that confusion. So I just say, hey, have a nice day, enjoy yourself, whatever, some general thing, but not necessarily greet them for that particular spiritual festival that's that would be my approach you know and uh, i don't know if i'm right or wrong but that's kind of how i feel thank you pastor it is clear to me okay it is clear all right uh, thank you thank you thank you elisha all right thank you everyone we like we're going to just take some time to pray and we will close uh, in prayer. I just want to thank all of you uh, for being part of uh, this journey uh, in you know, Bible College. I wish you know all of you were physically present, <laughs> and we could sit in a classroom and you know interact that way. Uh, that would be a lot of fun, and we could uh, you know really uh, learn a lot more. But uh, uh, these online classes are our second best option that uh, even though we cannot be together in the same classroom uh, physically uh, we can still connect from different parts of the world and uh, you know spend time learning asking questions growing together so uh, i want to thank you for staying faithful in the class staying faithful on this journey uh, and uh, i want to encourage you to continue the journey uh, next semester we reopen uh, second week of Jan, uh, we'll have 
a new set of courses, new things to learn. Uh, just feel free uh, to connect, to keep growing, and of course, use it in your ministries, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, uh, use these things in your life and ministry, okay? Let's pray together. We will close. Uh, could one of us uh, just pray together for the whole class, and then we will wrap up. Who wants to pray? All right. Everybody, go ahead, Sid Kano. Please pray. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We come to the throne of grace. Thank you, Father, the, the time you have given us, all the things we have learned about faith, Lord, that it should be used for your kingdom expansion and your work, Lord. Of your, not our name, but your name you glorify, Father. Thank you for Pastor. Thank you for all the students that we have learned today about faith and our course almost over, Lord. Whatever we have learned, it should be used for your kingdom expansion and your servants will be used mightily, Lord. Whatever we are be learning, we are be equipping with Lord, the knowledge you are getting here. Thank you for all the privileges, Lord, you have given us this, this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being on the class. So just look out for the assessments that I'll post. And uh, there. so we won't have lectures. Uh, just look out for the assessments. God bless you. It's been a wonderful journey. See you soon. Bye now.